What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. Super pumped to be talking about rebooting AI. We have Dr. Gary Marcus joining us on the show. Hi, Gary. Great to be here. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Thank you. So pumped for this. It's been a long time in the making, almost three years of aiming to make something like this happen, our conversation. And it's good timing because he has just published Rebooting AI, Building AI That We Can Trust. For those that don't know Gary's background, he's a scientist, best-selling author, and entrepreneur, founder and CEO of Robust AI, which is building a new foundation for the future of robotics, was founder and CEO of Geometric Intelligence, an ML company acquired by Uber in 2016, and is the author of five books, most recently Rebooting AI, which is about building computer systems with the conceptual framework of our world, time, space, causality, so we can trust them and not fear their operation. You can find all Gary's links below, GaryMarcus.com, robust.ai, robust as well as his Twitter, LinkedIn profiles, and the newest book, Rebooting AI. Gary, I love how you take things from this perspective of we are birthed into the world and we start building a conceptual framework. And the same style of how a child begins building a conceptual framework, if we can start helping our computer systems have a conceptual framework that's somewhat similar to that at least, can be a much more robust AI that we can trust. Is this about the general essence? Exactly right. And I mean, it goes back to Plato and Kant talking about innate ideas. So there's a long kind of distinction, nature versus nurture. I think anybody who's ever seriously studied the problem realizes it's both nature and nurture if you're talking about biology. So we have genes built in that help build rough drafts of our brains. Well, I wrote another book about that uh, some time ago called The Birth of the Mind. Um, it's pretty clear that that's how biology works. We don't know all the details, but it's clear we're not born blank slates. Um, politically, people might wish that we were, but we're not. Um, and nor are we born with every you know, detail of our brain complete, right? We learn a lot. Um, if you look at machine learning, though, in AI, it's really moved to one side of that spectrum, which is the nurture side of the spectrum. So people are trying to learn everything from raw, unanalyzed data. So like, how do you play Atari games? You feed in pixels and joystick motions and make the machine figure everything out without any conception of what a brick is or what gravity is or, or the goal of a game or anything like that. And you get results that sort of look good, but they're really just approximations. They don't really work um, when you change things. So if you're playing breakout and you move the paddle three pixels, the whole thing breaks down. So what I'm saying is we need some nature along with the nurture. We need to keep using clever ideas about machine learning, but we have to bring in some of what biology has, which is good starting points. Like for example, Kant in the Critique of Pure Reason talked about space and time and causality is critical. I think they're critical for machines too. We're trying to build machines without that, hoping for the best from vast uh, troves of big data. It's just not gonna work. I like the way that you frame it as this biological starting point, a nature. And what would you say would be that ideal framework to start things off with? <coughs> I mean, I would start by saying we don't, we're not trying to build replicas of human beings here, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I have two children and that's, you know, they're, they're, they're miniature humans with, with you know, human brains. I mean, we're not in, in the lab trying to do the same thing as, as biology. But I would say that there are some things biology does really well and some really poorly. So I wrote a whole book, another book, about all the things that the human mind does that are kind of substandard. So our memory systems, for example, are lousy. And in my book, Kluge, I talk about how it is that we could have evolved things that aren't optimal. Um, They're very associative. <laughs> but we have poor recall for the vast log of experience that we've had. Yeah, in we lives. don't have buffers, for example, where the last place I put my keys, which is <laughs> trivial to program <laughs> yeah. in a computer. Where did I put yeah. my car? And you go out into a lot that you park every day and you're like, I don't know. You, just, you have a conflation between all the different memories. Um, you don't have what a computer has, which is called garbage collection, right? So, um, and, and location addressable memory. So things are like, like first day of computer science, some of them are not built into the brain. So like our brains are not perfect. We don't want to copy them. We don't want to do arithmetic like people do. Like, hmm, did I remember to carry the one? I can't remember. Like, I mean, we, we don't want that. But there are things that human brains are really, really good at. 
um, in particular reasoning flexibly and understanding natural language and those go hand in hand mm -hmm. so if somebody's sitting here understanding this conversation they're connecting with things that they might have heard about before in linguistics or psychology or AI and they're very rapidly as we speak building up ideas about what we're talking about and then they can flexibly use that information so they could use it to decide whether they're going to believe the next news story they hear about AI or they'll bring it into a conversation with their friends or maybe make decisions about how to use it in their business. So people are really flexible with the information that we use and we can talk about it in very flexible ways. Machines can't do that. There's no AI system that can read a book like mine and come away explaining the main ideas or say, you know, why the examples were used the way they do, anything you'd expect of a sophisticated reader. So there are things that, <coughs> excuse me, humans can do much better than machines and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, the synthesis is going to be some of both. So you want, mm. you know, the, the ultimate like Star Trek computer should understand languages well as a person, but be able to read through vast, you know, tables in order to synthesize a new answer mm. in a way that no human could do. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay. So a starting point that takes some of the best principles of computational capacities as well as human biological capacities. That's right. And I didn't, I, it occurs to me, I didn't fully fit, answer your first question, let me come back to it. Um, what are those starting points? So one starting point I gave you was kind of conceptual, which is, you know, you want to take the best of humans and the best of computation. Um, another starting point is how do humans understand the world? And I would say it starts by having a framework. Mm -hmm. And that framework has some things in it. Like we know that there are objects and those objects continue to exist in space and time. There was some confusion, I think, from Piaget about that. But my best reading the developmental psychology literature is kids know that from the beginning. And then you learn about the specific objects that are in the world. Um, you know that there are psychological agents. You don't know everything about them, but you realize very early in life that um, another biological creature is different from a chair, right? You can have a conversation yeah. with a person, you can't have a conversation with a chair. Um, and you learn lots of details, like what chairs are like and what people are like. But you start with a framework where you can learn information about particular individuals, for example. So we know that it's not just that there's Alan-ness in the world, but that Alan is a particular person and um, he kind of travels on a space-time continuum. He's only going to be at one point at one time. There's not going to be four Alans at the same moment. We learn all of this stuff, but we have this basis of um, what objects are, what people are, and then we learn more information about that. As opposed to if you could just imagine, you just have light on your eyeballs and it dances around, then like the world would be, as William James said, a blooming, buzzing confusion. Mm -hmm. um, what allows us to learn about the world is that we know enough from the beginning to structure the kind of information that we get in. The machines yes. we're building right now don't have that basic structure except in some very limited ways and I think they suffer for it. So like you can talk to the GPT-2 system that's very popular, OpenAI released, and it will produce coherent sounding sentences, like the, the, or I should say grammatical sentences, the fluent sounding but it has no idea what it's actually talking about. If, it, if you make it talk for a little while, it will constantly contradict itself. It doesn't really understand the premises of what it's saying. And so what you get are the, like, the correlations. It knows which nouns and verbs follow each other in which context, but it knows nothing about the thing that it's actually talking about because it has no conception of space or time or objects or people. All these basic things that I think are part of humans and not just humans. I mean, think about um, the baby Ibex. It climbs down on the side of a mountain a couple hours after it's born. It has a basic understanding of three-dimensional geometry and things like that. It's not conscious, but it has evolved to do that. We need AI systems, if they're going to work, to have a similarly strong starting point rather than just being blank slates. Doesn't mean we toss away learning, but you don't learn much if you don't have a st strong starting point. What would you say would be the, let's go back, 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 and then we'll try and build up, as in what would be the first sort of framework that a child is born into the world with? You took an innateism stance versus the blank slate stance, and what are then those fundamental frameworks that a child is born into the world we with? don't know for sure i mean you know you can do different kinds of experiments to get at it so you can look at babies and see how they respond to things i did an experiment um, in 1999 in science that's been replicated um, that showed that babies 
at the age of um, seven months old are recognizing kind of abstract patterns. So we gave them sentences like la ta ta ga na na, and they were able to recognize whether other things followed the same patterns. And then other people showed that um, even newborns could do the same thing. And so that set of experiments, for example, shows that babies are looking for rules and patterns. That's one of the most basic things we're doing. Um, and a lot of current neural networks aren't looking for rules in the same sense. Um, that's just one example. There are other sets of experiments that show that babies seem to understand something about causality very early in life. They understand that you know, if one billiard ball strikes another, that the second one is likely to move. So that's kind of roots of causality. Um, babies, at least pretty early in life, seem to understand something about objects and they're not, even if they look identical, they're not identical, so they can do something that looks at least looks a little bit like arithmetic. I don't think it's literally that, but um, early in life, there, there's some calculus of objects and what they do. That's another thing that is, is presumably there very early in life. And I'll just pause to say that um, innate does not actually literally mean at birth. So like my ability to grow a beard was built into my biology, but it didn't emerge until I was you know 14 or whatever right. years old. So um, innate and early aren't the same, but when we see something very early, as early as we can test in newborns um, or, or infants, then we tend to think that it's probably built in. Um, it's, it's hard to perfectly prove these things. The, re the best studies that we could do from a scientific perspective are not the best we could do from an ethical perspective. So yeah, yeah. We, we really, to really answer some of these questions, you would have to do what we call deprivation studies. So or what, simulations. Or, or you, know, you raise a child on, if you want to know what kids know about gravity, you raise a child on a space station yeah, and see yeah. what happens or something. But yeah. we can't ethically just like assign you know, kids to different conditions in those experiments. So some things remain unknown. But the best guesses from my own work and work from people like Elizabeth Spelke and Renee Bayerjean and so forth, um, is that kids have some conception of the world to get started um, that centers around things like space, time, object, causality, personhood or agenthood and so forth. And that could even likely be from the parents, the parental experiences and their parents and their parents, just this transgenerational. I think it's transgenerational, but I think it's genetically transmitted. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think there's a lot of information that is transmitted by teaching and, and by imitation and just by observing parents. But some of it, the most basic foundations, I think are part of the mammalian brain plan mm -hmm. um, and, or, or even the vertebrate brain plan. And That's so, had a long history of evolving to see things like uh, fire and language and the basic ways that we go and get food and that we love each other and these types of things have conversations. Yeah, I mean, language itself is a complicated case and we could come back to it. But mm -hmm. I would say that, you know, for a billion years, evolution has been evolving creatures that have some basic comprehension of their world and understand about obstacles and objects and predators and, and prey. Yes. And, you know, you look at the so-called precocial animals like the ibex that are born and basically able to walk and it's clear that um, genes can do that. Um, there's still calibration, so you still have to figure out how strong are my legs and um, like the vervet monkey, for example, is born with three calls, which basically am amount to aerial predator, land predator, and, and so mm. forth. And they yes. have to learn exactly what those look like. They have to learn what an eagle's like, but they are born essentially knowing that there are things up in the air that you need to worry about and that you should do a certain particular call if you see them. Yes, yes. Now then, how, let's move to that next step then, which is, okay, what about then the conceptual frameworks for building artificial intelligence that we can trust, that we don't need to fear? How do we embed time, space, causality into computers? They systems? don't really exist yet. I think that right now, I mean, people have thought about it some, but I think that for the last seven years, people have spent almost all of their effort on systems that don't have a lot of conceptual framework. Um, that are really good at picking up on statistics and they've been very fruitful for things like speech recognition. So speech recognition, you can hear a bunch of um, syllables you, and um, you can correlate the auditory stream that you hear with labels for what, what's going on. And so the dominant paradigm for the last seven years is really about labeling. So you see a picture of a dog and you tell the machine this should be a dog. You see a picture of a chair, you tell the machine that this should be a chair. And the technique that people are using is pretty good for that. So if you show it another chair, there's a good chance, if it's not too different from the other chairs that's seen before, that it will recognize the chair or it'll recognize the dog if it's not too different um, from the dog that's seen before. It doesn't mean the system has the slightest clue what a chair is for. Yes. It doesn't mean that the system understands that some chairs um, you know, have cushions and others don't, and that some are made of wood and some no, are not. Yeah. It doesn't mean that the machine understands anything about the properties of those objects. 
But we, we built these systems that are really good at categorizing, and people got really excited about it. And then there's some very nice commercial applications. The most life-changing one might be speech recognition, but it's really great to have automatic photo tagging is another example. Yeah. Um, and so people have gotten kind of obsessed with the tool that they have. You know, the famous saying is, to a man with a hammer, everything is a nail. Yeah. There's a lot of hammer and nail-itis right now. And so I think people are working really hard to make their hammers just a little bit more efficient. How can we you know, make the, the metal of the hammer strike a little bit better and stuff like that. You said they, something along the lines of that uh, m machine learning is critical for building robust AI and deep learning is pretty good for machine learning. And with deep learning, we're doing these things with big data, with statistical models, with convolutional neural networks. This is kind of this paradigm for image recognition for that's right and it's speech. great stuff like it's really genuinely useful i don't want to say that it's not yeah. but it's like this hammer and nail thing so yeah. it's really great for the <coughs> problem of categorizing things and if you have labeled examples of the things you want to categorize it's great it's not great for reasoning and it's not great for language so systems have been built on this and they can pick up all kinds of subtle statistical detail but at the end of the day they don't really understand the things that they're talking about it's just not the right tool for that so the brain has you know many different brain regions that do different things we don't know everything about it but you know we know the occipital cortex and Broca's area are doing really different things and deep learning is kind of like the occipital cortex it's, it's there for some part of vision it's really not doing anything like what we think Broca's area is doing where you take a sentence and you break it down into its parts and then you understand the meaning by putting together those parts. Deep learning doesn't really do that. It doesn't do what Broca's area does. It doesn't do what prefrontal areas do in terms of kind of making rational calculations about complex ideas. It just doesn't do that. And so it's like, it would be as, I mean, it's almost also like the blind man and the elephant. It's like, you know, people have discovered a trunk and they think that that's the whole elephant and it's not, it's, it's a piece of it. I wonder what then would be beyond just the trunk, which is this deep learning um, passion that we have for image recognition and natural language. What would be a interesting way for you to hypothesize the construction of computer systems that have uh, understandings of conceptual time space. Causality. The first thing I think that the field needs to do is to get past the kind of holy war that has gone on for 60 some years, um, which is between two approaches. One is the approach from which deep learning emerged, um, which tries to find things, people call them neural networks. They're vaguely like brains, but they're, they're fundamentally they're statistical approximators that look at a lot of data. And that's one tradition and it goes back to the 50s and arguably the 40s. Um, and then there's this other approach, <coughs> which Statistical is- Statistical approximators for big data was the first. Yeah, I mean, originally it was even with little data and now it works because it has big data. If you have small amounts of data, your statistical approximations aren't that good. But so, so there were, people have been taking one approach which is basically about statistical approximation. Um, and machine learning is, is kind of a part of that. I mean, I'm being a little bit sloppy here. And then there's another approach which has really been about knowledge and it comes from the tradition of like Bertrand Russell and Gottlieb Frege and so forth, which is about representing things in formal languages or things close to that. And computer programming comes from that tradition and it works great. So if you want a web browser, you don't want a machine learn how the web browser works by giving labeled examples of people clicking at pages and what images they show. You want to write software for that in the traditional sense. You want to have if thens, if the user presses this key, then do this thing, load the contents of this buffer, co copy it over to this other buffer. Um, and so there's a whole approach of AI that is built around what we call symbol manipulation, which looks a lot like traditional computer programming for you know, many people in your audience um, will, will have done that. And the two approaches have not liked each other for a very long time. They've each wanted to say, do it our way or the highway. And the modern representative of the do it our way or the highway on the machine learning side is Jeff Hinton, who has gone around saying basically simple manipulation is like gasoline engines and deep learning is like electric engines. Stop using the civil manipulation stuff. Um, you know, it's, it's antiquated and you should just use my electric power. Um, he's very hostile to symbol manipulation. And the reality is we need both. Um, the reality is his metaphor is not really right. It's not really like a choice between gasoline engines and electric engines. It's really like we have different techniques. It's more like we need power screwdrivers, hammers, 
nails. We need all kinds of different techniques mm -hmm. because the fundamental problem we're trying to solve is itself um, what a psychologist would call multidimensional. There are many different aspects of intelligence mm -hmm. and it's absurd to expect one silver bullet. And I know he's enamored of his silver bullet um, of you know, this kind of machine learning from, from raw statistical data. But the reality is that what you do as a thinking creature ranges from recognizing patterns you've seen before um, at a kind of concrete perceptual level, which deep learning is good for, to making inferences about complex ideas that you've only just been exposed to and saying, does this fit with these other ideas? And, and deep learning is just not a good tool for that. And symbol manipulation is a better way to represent, for example, things that are compositional. You put the parts together to make larger and larger parts. So we say the book on the couch, and then we say the book that's on the couch that's in the room, and the book that's on the couch that's in the room, that's in the house, that's in um, this particular suburb of California, and so forth. And you can understand how all the parts fit together. You know, the cat that chased the rat that chased the mouse, uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. We can build more and more complicated ideas, and that's part of what civilization is based on. We need different tools for that. Symbols are really good tools for that. We use them, for example, in mathematics. That's how we do physics. Yeah. Is, you know, we put together symbols that represent abstract ideas. Yes. The thought that we're gonna build AI sort of with a hand tied behind our back because you know, some person who's famous happens not to work in that domain is crazy. Wow, okay, and then would, would it be maybe fair to hear your, let's hear your thoughts on this. If, uh, if we had an ongoing, let's say a clock, of 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 t of all time and we turned on a computer system and the first thing it did was calibrate itself along with this big m moving time that's happening with mm -hmm. all of the humans that know what date it is and that we're meeting at this time and the computer systems begin also working on that same idea of time would that then enable them to talk to each other and talk to other humans on the same idea of time to start. I would say the first thing you want to do is just build a variable in your system, which is time or moment or something like that, um, so that the machine doesn't have to induce the very fact that there's time. And I would want to build in some procedures and some, some basic things, like it should realize that time flows linearly. And um, you might want to build in things like people have birth dates and death dates and they're not here before they're born and they're not here after. I would build in some basic things so you can interpret the rest. The alternative is like, I don't know, you have a video camera on the world and you somehow have to induce that things follow in temporal sequence and nobody has ever built a machine that does anything like that, that actually induces from kind of just raw data that time exists or that space exists. Um, the closest is these neural networks now build in a notion of space that handle some aspects of space. So they build in the notion of um, what we call spatial invariance or translational invariance. So um, if I see my a hand here, then I see this image over here, they're probably the same thing as the same image. So convolution is a way of building that in. It, it's a clever technique that's built in and then people were like, I don't wanna build anything else in. I do machine learning and they stress the word learning. They don't, they don't want anything else um, to be built in. But I, I think it's too hard to, to induce the rest. And I think, you know, it took a long time to evolve the, you know, let's say the mammalian brain, but you won't find a mammal that doesn't understand time intuitively, more or less from the moment mm. it's born. Yes. Right? Yes. It's not like, you know, some, uh, you know, pygmy marmoset or something like that is so smart that it's able to like extract the, the basic temporal nature of the universe by hanging out. Like, that's built into the marmoset's brain and it's built into our brains. Mm -hmm. Through a long period of evolution. So then would the, would the other um, functionalities like we want to see all of these new upcoming successes with AI helping us with medical diagnostics. We want to see it succeeding with autonomous <coughs> vehicles. We want to see it succeeding with all different aspects of making our lives better. And then are we going to be building specific narrow AIs for those applications? How do we figure out to invest time and resources into that? 
versus this building from this really first principled framework of time, space, and causality? How do we so it's a great question. So we didn't quite make explicit before this distinction um, that you just alluded to between narrow AI and general AI. So narrow AI works on a very specific problem and general AI is it doesn't exist yet, but the notion is that it would be able to solve a wide range of problems. And it turns out that with existing t techniques that I would call narrow AI, we're able to, for example, build machines that play Go and chess extremely well, um, but not to read very well. Um, so nobody's been able to adapt the same techniques that work that Go and chess to a more open-ended problem like reading. So Go, you know, the rules haven't changed in 2,000 years. The board's always the same size. It's a very closed problem. Whereas reading is an open-ended problem. You never know what you might see next. So maybe there'll be a cartoon, maybe there'll be a joke about a favorite television show. You have to be able to kind of roll with the punches and integrate all kinds of different information. So that's open-ended. And the more open-ended something is, the more it seems like we need a general approach to AI. Then you get that into some of the specific problems and it's interesting. So like, we don't know for sure whether driverless cars can be built with narrow AI um, in a way that's reliable. So people are trying to do that trying to build driverless cars that don't really have a conception of what a construction site is or what a police officer is or mm. um, what a highway is, but know enough narrow rules to get by. But what we're finding is that doesn't really work. So you have, for example, at least five times in the last 18 months, a Tesla has run into a stopped vehicle on a highway. So emergency vehicles, uh, tow trucks, fire trucks, police um, cars. Right? The systems don't have a conception of what a stopped vehicle is on the side of the road and they're not able to cope with it. So it might be empirically that to really deal with all of the range of cases like that, we need a general intelligence that is able to reason about the things that it sees and how the world is fit together. Or maybe we'll be lucky and we don't have to and we can just gather enough data from enough cases. My feeling is we're not doing that well um, when we try to do it without some kind of general intelligence. And that what happens is there's always some core cases we do very well, and then a periphery around it where the current techniques don't work that well. So, you know, core cases, driving on the highway when traffic is moving smoothly and the weather is good, yeah, yeah. and the system is great at that. You know, it's better than a person because it pays more attention. And you might think about level four autonomous driving where it helps you sort of like cruise control. That's all well and good. But fully trusting the system, right, the subtitle of the book is about building AI that we can trust. Fully trusting a system means not just you know, like cruise control, but you're always still paying attention. It'd be like, I can actually read a book in the back. Um, and before you could do that, it would have to deal with the periphery cases too. And so periphery is like, there aren't a lot of data recorded about um, tow trucks stopped on the side of the road. And, and, you know, you might gather, you might put a camera in a car for a million hours and not, or well, for a hundred thousand hours and not see that. And you so these the bizarre long tail. So exactly, it's exactly about the bizarre long tail. So outliers or edge cases, people have different names. I was using periphery right now. The outliers are these cases in the long tail, which means there's not that many of them, right? The fat tail is there's many, many cases of being, you know, four meters behind, um, you know, this kind of, you know, be, behind a, te a Tesla or something like that. Um, there's just so much data about that. But there's not a lot of data about what happens when there are tow trucks. And there's, there's even less data about like um, uh, electric skateboards in, in the streets of Manhattan. And so you want a system that's flexible enough to deal with an electric skateboard, even if it wasn't in the sample of data that it's looking at. Um, you could also think of this like in terms of like politics and you do polls, you need a big sample. The, the, in order to cover all the possibilities with dumb techniques, um, they don't really understand the world. You need so much data in order to get a representative enough sample. What people do is not that they have that vast a database, although they have a lot, um, but they have reasoning techniques and kind of a knowledge about how the world works. So if some police officer comes by with a hand lettered sign saying, please don't go here, you're like, well, it's a police officer and must have written it on the sign because they didn't have time. It must be a recent emergency and I'm gonna take his word for it or her word for it and then I'm gonna go around. Um, and so you could reason about that. Whereas these systems would be like, they don't have anything like that in the database and so they just drive right ahead or whatever. Um, and so there's this infinite range in driving of, um, of cases that you just haven't seen before. And that makes driving really hard to solve with narrow AI. 
natural language is even worse. Like every sentence that you hear that's interesting, you never heard before. Sure, I was there, about to ask you about this with IBM Watson seems to be like the big issue that with scanning through all these new medical papers and trying to find something. Well, it didn't, it didn't work, right? So, so yeah. IBM Watson, um, I mean, I should be careful lest I get sued, but so I, IBM Watson, um, you know, won at Jeopardy and that was very impressive, but it turned out to be a narrower job than we initially thought. So it looked like, wow, it's understanding natural language. But it turns out that almost every answer in Jeopardy is the title of a Wikipedia page. And so then that means your job is not really to understand the question. It's just to find which question, or sorry, which Wikipedia page comes closest to the question. Wow. And that turns out to be a lot easier. I think it's 94 and a half percent or something of the answers are like that. And if you combine that with the speed of the computer hitting the buzzer, you know, you're good to go. But it doesn't mean the system actually understands things. So then some of the top brass at IBM, not necessarily the people working on Watson, said, well, can you make this do medicine? And I think some of the people working on Watson were like, well, that's actually a harder problem. And they're like, no, you're going to make this do medicine. And they kind of scaled back over the years from we're going to make it a doctor to we're going to make, we're going to teach students to we're going to help with animal care or something like that. Like they really um, backed down. Um, and you know, the original idea was it's going to do great medical diagnosis, but even easy cases it sometimes made mistakes on. So, like, it failed to diagnose um, heart attacks sometimes. And it didn't really understand the stuff that it's working with. So there are all these tricks um, that you might call text processing, but distinct from actually understanding language. So text processing includes things like keyword search. So you can see that, you know, this word often occurs in this context, and so you can guess that it's, a, you know, affiliated with this thing. But that's not the same thing as knowing the causal mechanism, knowing... Um, you know, that, that a failed, um, you know, that the heart is a pump. Like, if you know that the heart is a pump, then you can reason about what happens if the pump doesn't work. But if you don't actually understand what a mechanical pump is, it's, you don't really have a concept of what the circulatory system is about. And Watson doesn't really understand what a pump is, and nor does any other AI system, really. I mean, someone may have built a narrow AI system for that. There are simulations for the heart. But no, nobody has a general system that can kind of read a biology textbook and come away with a conceptual underpinning such that it could use that information in different ways. The closest we have is a system now that can do multiple choice questions, but it's still like using the statistical things. It's not that hard to break. Um, my co-author just saw this new system and a day later found an example. To break it is like um, something like um, a certain pig died last Tuesday um, and then multiple choice. Um, will it come back to life next week, the week after, or never? And the system, like, you know, somehow <laughs> next week and back to life are correlated, and the system comes up with next week. It doesn't really understand what death is. Um, and, you know, if you don't have the conceptual underpinnings yeah. of death, then you don't really understand biology. You gave a couple other interesting ones, like, did George Washington own a computer? It's like, okay, computer was invented, you know, 670 years or whatever ago. You can count in different ways, but all the like ways that you can count, you can go back you know, to Babbage died, or whatever, yeah. but it was not, there were no computers Computer in George Washington's around. time, and, and people yeah. should know that and should be able to figure out. Even though there's no, I mean, the point of that example is a lot of things you can look up by keyword search. But you can't look that one up, or you couldn't before we wrote this thing in the, the Times. Um, you couldn't look up. Nobody had a sentence, George Washington was alive before computers were invented. If you had keyword search, then great, you're done. But if nobody happened to have that sentence, then in order to answer the question, was George Washington alive, um, or I mean, did he have a computer? Then you have to understand, he couldn't have a computer if he was alive before there were computers. It's, it's trivial for you know any ordinary, human, yeah. at least adult human being, <laughs> yeah, probably yeah. most kids. kids yeah. um, but the systems don't have a conceptual framework of life, death, span of introduction of an invention, and so forth. And so if it's not in the keyword search, they can't put it together. I'm really interested to see where our global resources are going to go for building this first principled conceptual framework of general intelligence, as well as where we're going to put resources towards narrow intelligences. Um, and I really appreciate how you're pushing us to see things from a first principle conceptual framework just like the human is forms when they're born. I love that aspect to what you're teaching. I took a lot of philosophy as an undergrad and I think that you know that taught me to look at the big picture and not just the thing that you're pounding away on right now. And I think the, the field in general is kind of pounding away with the tool that's right there and there's money to be made and you know it's not totally crazy but it doesn't put the field as a whole in the position to do the right thing to solve the, the harder problems. So if, if we really want to solve 
medicine and have machines integrate all of the stuff they read and machines have to be able to read. And that's like not on the agenda of what you know, Google and Facebook are necessarily trying to do if, if what they're trying to do is sell ads. I mean, there's some research in those companies, but um, you do, if, if the goal was really the long term, you might yeah. set things up differently. Yes. One proposal I made was to build something like CERN for mm. um, AI, where you could have a large, multidisciplinary, multinational collaboration. Yeah. Um, there are problems with that idea, so you want to make sure that it doesn't just become a bunch of academics finding funding for their own particular research. It have to be coordinated with a goal and so forth. Yes. But I think that's one possibility. Another possibility that I'm following right now is I built my own company. I can't take on all of this, but we're trying to take on some of this with respect to robotics. The company's yes. called Robust.ai, and we're trying to go after some of the harder problems that we think other people are, are running away from because their tools don't work, and we're trying to build a new set of tools. So it's you know, also possible, at least in some circumstances, to do it in a corporate environment. Now, you started hinting at this a little bit. I love this idea of some sort of like a global multidisciplinary effort with the goal of building a general intelligence. How or even just a system that can read. Like, you know, forget <laughs> general, general intelligence, but just like be able to read, with, you know, and of course there's an interaction between the two. But the like start, people forget yeah. that current computers are illiterate. Like, yeah. you know, people are like, is AI gonna be here in 10 years? Like, not if it can't read. Like, if you can't, you know, read the unstructured part of Wikipedia, the stuff that's not in boxes, then like how are you gonna you know bootstrap your system so then what would you say we're moving into this <clears throat> information technology exponential technology age there's eight billion of us the amount of democratization of these powers is, is happening across so mm -hmm. many aspects of of biotech neurotech ai all these types of things um how do you foresee us uh, geopolitically harmonizing more? Is this a process of like self-work that we need to go with? I'm not in? currently super optimistic on that side. So I mean, one codicil to what you just said is um, there are ways in which AI is becoming more democratic and less democratic. So what's great is a lot of stuff is being published openly. Some of it's being patented and not everybody's talking about that. So um, places like Google do a lot of patenting in the AI domain. Um, so there, there's some questions there, but the, the bigger question is the techniques that people are building are very computationally expensive. So you know sometimes one simulation run in one of these neural networks can cost a hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars. So just because everybody and, and their brother can watch a Coursera course and or sister and watch a Coursera course and learn how these techniques work doesn't mean they can do it at scale. And the techniques don't necessarily work if they're not at scale. So one thing I think a lot of corporations find out is like what works for Google with the massive amount of data that Google has doesn't necessarily work for a <coughs> smaller company um, where there's not as much data. And um, so there's tensions both around like the ability to, the, uh, let me start that sentence again. Um, th there's techniques that now anybody can use, but to use them well, you need Google style or, or Google scale compute and Google scale data and not everybody has that available. Now, the techniques that the human mind uses are not so driven by data, and you know your brain uses like 20 watts, not 20,000 watts. Um, so it is possible in principle with the brain as an existence proof to have AI techniques that don't demand a lot of data, that don't demand an enormous amount of compute, but those aren't the ones that are being developed right now. So the ones that are being democratized are the ones that Google and Facebook and Amazon and so forth are best position to use and not necessarily ones that you at home can use you know that well you might be able to build um, something for your doorbell to detect whether um, you know the UPS truck has arrived there's some things that even at home people can do but people at home are not going to be using these tools to build real natural language understanding Gary what has <coughs> been your connection with source or with the divine and then how do you see our connections with that higher power uh, being relevant to our global harmony? I, I'm not a divine power kind of guy. Um, I do take a lot of inspiration from nature. Um, I moved to the Pacific Northwest because I just love the beauty of it all. And, and um, so, I mean, I guess my connection is I'm pretty amazed with what nature has come up with and I like to surround myself with, with many of its products. Do you think we're in a simulation? I do not. Um, I understand the arguments that people like Elon Musk have given, um, but again, I don't see any direct evidence for it. Do you want to 
give me a, an argument for it. <laughs> We're here to just feature how you feel about it. We, we've taken a lot of uh, interesting I, perspectives. I, I, don't, I don't see any direct evidence for the hypothesis. Um, I guess another thing I'll say is it's much harder to build really good simulations than I think a lot of people realize. So, um, you know, it's one thing to build a simula simulation like Grand Theft Auto, um, <coughs> but to build a really detailed simulation of the world, particularly human behavior, mm -hmm. um, is really, really hard. And nobody really knows how to do that. There are also more mundane things. Like, we don't really know how to simulate liquids that well. And, I mean, you could imagine, you could tell some science fiction story about how the year is actually you know 20,200 and and you're just toying with me right now in the brain in the vat kind of style and you know you've decided to immerse me in this environment in, in which um, the simulation tools themselves are lousy in order to make the whole thing I mean you, know, you, you can make up a story but if you are talking about certainly the technology that is available today it's not good enough to make simulations that um, have the richness of the real world. So like, um, you know, you can look YouTube uh, for like physics engine fails and you'll find yeah. things like a car that's sitting here on the side of the road and then it just starts jumping up and down for no reason because there's like some instability in the st simulator and we don't see that stuff in the real world. So, you know, <laughs> it, it would have to be a very elaborate story to make sense of the facts. And then the more coincidences that you rest on the lower the probability is. You know, it's not zero, but it's not, you know, it, it's not the best explanation of the data I have in front of me. What would you say is an, the most important skill for young kids like your children as well as the adults as we go into this exponential technology age to learn? Um, I mean, first I would say that not everything is exponential. So, <coughs> The ability of machines to read has not grown exponentially. It's grown hardly at all in 50 years. Um, so not everything is exponential. But I'll presume for the sake of argument that like it... Like Moore's Law, Carlson Curve stuff. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so a lot of stuff follows that, but, but general intelligence hasn't, right? So there's not actually been growth in general intelligence. So one thing to say is that <coughs> if general intelligence isn't uh, rising that fast, but narrow intelligence is, then it's not a good way to make your living doing a narrow intelligence because it's going to be replaced. Um, so you don't want to be the guy scooping ice cream cones because the machine's going to be doing that pretty soon. Um, but creativity is going to be valued for a long time because machines are not really that good at it. And for the moment, machines are not that good at careful reading of things. And so you know, learning to read well may distinguish us from machines for quite some time. Um, the last people to be replaced will be entertainers because we will like the fact that they are human beings. So, you know, kids growing up to be entertainers is, is you know, an interesting possibility. Um, I think scientists are going to be around for a while, not forever. Um, you know, if, if I really do my job with AI, scientists will get replaced sooner. Um, but I think the problems are hard enough that they won't get replaced immediately. If you take a long perspective, like 10,000 years from now, um, I, I don't think there'll be many jobs. I think we'll have a different kind of economy. Um, where people have to derive their value from their creative pursuits and not from their work, not, not from paid work. Um, you know, there's just not going to be that many paid jobs 10,000 years from now. And then you could just, you can extrapolate or whatever, interpolate in between, and maybe 30 years from now, there'll be fewer paid jobs than there are now, um, and you know, 1,000 years fewer still. Um, we're just not going to be able to... Um, have a society that is organized around finding meaning from paid work because it just won't be enough. Yeah, even the permutation potential for creativity for computation is just 10,000 years from now just feels like what creative output could still even be left that's undiscovered. Um, how about what is the most beautiful thing in the world? I'd say nature in all of its forms, the way, <coughs> the way that species are so exquisitely adapted to their niches and the the way in which the systems that are built they're not always perfect but they're you know often sort of from an engineering standpoint pretty spectacular and you know we're just catching up to nature in some things and not others right i mean ai is a case where we have not caught up uh entirely with nature we've caught up in little corners of it right so we can build AI systems that play Go better than people, but 
terms of general intelligence, which is part of nature, we still have not caught up. Oof. This has been super fun, Gary. I really appreciate you coming on our show and talking to us. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very, much. very much. It's for fun. Coming on. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Also, to have more conversations with your friends, family, coworkers, people online about rebooting AI, about building a new conceptual framework for time, space, causality versus narrow intelligences. Have more conversations about it and get building more, everyone. Also, do check out the links in the bio below. Check out the link, GaryMarcus.com, also Robust.ai. His Twitter profile, his LinkedIn profile, and the book, Rebooting AI, as well as down there. Support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the organizations, the leaders around the world that you believe in. Support them, help them grow, support simulation. Our links are below to our PayPal, cryptocurrency, Patreon, and Design Cool Merch. You can pay all that stuff's below. Thank you, Ori Shapiro, our co-producer, for cutting this episode. I greatly appreciate it. And go and build the future, everyone, and manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you soon. Peace.